Italy. Birthplace of the Renaissance. So the Renaissance took place roughly between 1300s to 1600s. So keep in mind, when we talk about the Renaissance, it's not like World War II, World War I, we're talking about this specific set of 10, 20, 30, 40 years. We're talking about a very vague period of 300 years. Right? To give you an idea of how wide that time frame is, Donatello's David was made in 1420, while Leonardo da Vinci died in the early 1500s, so almost 100 years later. So it's, we're talking about a big, big span of time here. Now, um, the definition of the Renaissance, it means rebirth. And uh, the book has conveniently condensed it into three categories in regards to why the Renaissance occurred. So let's go run through each one. So first we have thriving cities. So trade was thriving, Italy was doing well economically, and when you're doing well economically, you have the opportunity to engage and to have time for activities that would be perhaps considered not necessary to survival, such as arts. And as a result, um, it gave plenty of time as well as money uh, in the Italian city-states to help fund the various art projects. Now some of the major city-states, you've probably heard of them, include places like Milan, Venice, and Florence, and Naples, and of course uh, Rome. Now. Secondly, we had the merchants rise. So unlike the past periods where we had those who had land or those who are rich, we begin to see this new class emerge based on meritocracy, a word we looked at when we were studying the gentry class of the Song Dynasty. So what this word means is that those who do the best get the best positions. So as merchants rised up the ranks, those who are better at their business became richer and made more money. In other words, individual achievement became a major factor. Right? It was no longer about, oh, what family are you born to? Oh, what lands do you own? It was more about what have you achieved in your life. The Medici family was a powerful banking family in Florence, and they contributed greatly to the arts. Um, last but not least, we have the return of Greco-Roman culture. So if you remember the Middle Ages, in this time period, there was very little literature, there was very little learning. Yes, the first universities emerged then, but obviously in very limited capacity. And as well as when you look at the major breakthroughs made in the so-called quote-unquote Middle Ages, most of these were in China and the Arab world. During this time period, though, there's one guy we have to especially appreciate. His name is Charlemagne. Only was he a very interesting historical figure, but we have to appreciate the fact that he kept the various Latin manuscripts from the Greco-Roman times, and as a result, when the Renaissance came along, we had various scholars bring these manuscripts from places like Constantinople. We also had uh, Latin manuscripts that survived in Europe, and as a result, various arts, artists, scholars were able to study what the Greeks did and the Rome, Romans did during the Renaissance period. Thus, the word rebirth is perhaps very appropriate. Classical values during this period and humanism become very important. So as we saw in the Middle Ages, people are slowly shifting away from the church. But the church is slowly losing its power, the pope is slowly losing its power, and the focus is becoming more on intellectual movements and human potential. Right, so instead of looking at the Bible for all the guidance, keep in mind people are still very much religious and they believe in God, but they're also believing that it's not only about looking at God and the Bible and the church, but there are values beyond that. And humanists studied these concepts of human potential and achievement and applied them in the areas of literature and philosophy. Today, we know this as a category of humanities. Another shift we see is in the concept of how people live their day-to-day -day lives. During the Middle Ages, it was all about piety. It was all about living a very calm, not having ostentatious goods, dressing up quite modestly. But now, in the Renaissance period, people realize it's okay to enjoy material goods. It's okay to listen to music and dine with fine foods. And they believe that you can live this life of lifestyle without offending God. Now, the secular movement refers to people moving towards a less religious society. So again, keep in mind, this is a little bit different from, let's say, the atheist movement or an agnostic movement in the 1900s. Uh, people still are religious, but their focus is shifting now. Their focus is 
no longer on God and the church, but their focus is living in the current world, right? The here and now is what's important. You know, what are we having for dinner tonight? What kind of music are we dancing to after that? Right? That's what matters. It's not about what's going to happen after we die, right? We have to enjoy the here and now. And uh, throughout this period, there are various patrons, such as the Medici family I mentioned earlier, but also the church helped out by allowing people to paint in their buildings. Perhaps one of the most famous is the Sistine's Chapel uh, by Michelangelo, which we'll talk about a little later. During this period, there is a man who emerges called Leonardo da Vinci, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail in a second, but he's also known as the Renaissance man, a great word, uh, which means an ideal individual who strives to master all arts. So when we say arts here, we're not talking about just the paintbrushes and the pottery. We're talking about all various types of fields, whether it's mathematics, the science, the humanities, and so on. This type of individual man is called a Renaissance man. So in the modern era, it's pretty hard to think of a Renaissance man because, you know, we live in a society where people specialize, right? Especially in college and post-college, if you like numbers, maybe you study mathematics and accounting and then you become an accountant and that's what you pursue. Right? You might have a second career, but I mean, nonetheless, that's just two careers. So I did a little bit of research and I came up with two people who may potentially be considered quote-unquote Renaissance men. So the first is Story Musgrave. Musgrave, during his career, was working in avi aviation. He was also a skilled electrician, a mathematician. He also had the capability of performing surgery, and he was also a professor who had an MBA and also flew to space. So quite the resume there. The next person has a fewer in numbers, but perhaps in terms of quality, more impressive. So we have uh, Brian May who was a chancellor of the Liverpool University. He also had a PhD in math and physics, and he is known as one of the best guitarists ever to walk on planet Earth. Quite impressive, both of these guys, May and Musgrave. So in regards to how art was revolutionized during this period, it very much relates to humanism and the idea of focusing on secularism, where the focus now is on citizens the people. So how does this differ from the Middle Ages? Well, it's the exact opposite. The Middle Ages was about focusing on God. Now, in the Renaissance, it's about focusing on people. For example, we have Donatello's sculpture of David. This David is obviously representing David from David and Goliath, and um, he created this in the early 15th century. There's also a good book called David and Goliath. I know it's not really relevant except for the title, but if you have an opportunity, I definitely recommend this book by Malcolm Gladwell. Moving on to perhaps the most important Renaissance person, in fact, the Renaissance man himself, Leonardo da Vinci, author of The Last Supper, Vitruvian Man, Mona Lisa, and um, various other pieces of art. So his most famous art was the Mona Lisa, and it's believed to have taken 10 years to finish, perhaps even more than that. Now what makes the Mona Lisa such an enigmatic, interesting, ambitious piece is how mysterious it is. For example, the smile, it's like not quite, people aren't quite sure if she's smiling or not. Her eyes, it's as if her eyes are always following you around, whether you're looking at it from the left or the right or from the center. There's also a big mystery about who it is. Some say maybe it's a self-portrait of da Vinci. Others say it could be Isabella of Argonne. Others say it could have been Gion Giocamo Caprotti. We're not sure. So like the Indus Valley or the Egyptian pyramids, we'll never know. But perhaps that's a fun thing about the Mona Lisa, right? Of how much of a mystery this piece of art is today. I'm into something here that I cannot understand. So many interesting theories. But please keep in mind the Da Vinci Code is not real, but it's a fun watch. So if you have time, take a look. A film from 2006. Moving on to Raphael. So he's younger than Michelangelo and Leonardo, and he is most famous for the School of Athens. So in this piece, he includes various historical figures. So this is the painting itself. I'm going to give you about just 10 seconds to take a look at it, see if you recognize anyone, anywhere. So there is the Plato and Aristotle in the middle, right? not to get confused with Socrates. Right? Socrates is not in this painting. We have Pythagoras. 
who uh, you've, I'm sure, heard of from the Pythagoras Theorem. We also have guys like Ptolemy and Michelangelo. And um, there's actually a page on line that summarizes who's what. And you'll notice even historians are not in complete agreement. Disagreement over whether number seven is someone we've studied, Alexander the Great or not. Perhaps the most interesting among these figures is number 16, the father of cynicism, Diogenes. Now here are just some fun pieces of, by previous classes of their original version of the School of Athens, putting together various figures we have looked at the past six, seven months, whether it be Attila the Hun, King Tut, Joan of Arc, Moses, we even have the Homo erectus, I think on the right bottom there, obviously Genghis Khan and Da Vinci in the middle. Uh, this one has many characters. Of course, we got Scipio on the right bottom team. Alexander the Great, King Leonidas, and so on. So moving on to the final point of this section, which is Machiavelli. So Machiavelli wrote a book about how politicians should run their countries or their states. Now what made this piece very interesting is that until then, there was a thought that you had to be a good Christian, a good person to be a good leader. Machiavelli disagrees. He believes that to be a good leader, it means you have to do what is politically correct, even if it goes against what is morally wrong. So for example, if there's a group of people who are trying to plot against you, it's not morally correct to take their children as hostages and try to control them. But if it's politically correct and helps you gain power, Machiavelli would agree with the proposition. Some of the major beliefs he had was that politics and religion should be separated. He also believed in pragmatism. Look at the effect of the thing rather than the thing itself. And finally, he was a strong believer in regards to how rulers rule and how people want to be ruled are important when one is governing any given state. A disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Blah, 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 blah. Have a nice day. Goodbye.